I'm so pleased to see you all to um, yet another conversation that we have in the city. Uh, and it's so good to see that um, we, we have so many engaged people who really um, care about our city and how we are doing. And um, what more important than getting our economy and our most important sectors in the city going again. So we are going to have um, um, a number of panelists tonight, not just um, one person I'm going to interview. Um, and, and that conversation takes until um, about a quarter to seven and then it's over to you and you can ask the questions. So let me just sort of get into this subject. But a bath is open again, isn't that wonderful? Open to tourism, but everything is still heavily restricted. And we won't see in the numbers of tourists from abroad anytime soon. So can actually our domestic visitors make up for all the visitors that we have seen in the past coming from all corners of the world? Will the announcements from the Chancellor today actually help our industries? Can we really feel safe when we go out again and enjoy ourselves? And will going out be ever the same again, or the same at least for a long period to come. So we've got a number um, of people answering and talking about these issues tonight. First of all, we have got um, Catherine Davis from Visit Bath. We've got Chris Stevens from the Hoburn Museum, Andrew Peters from Green Park Brasserie, Councillor Paul Crossley. But first up, we will hear from Alison Curran from the Bath Area Self catering association. So um, I want, would like to um, have my first uh, uh, conversation with Alison. Is Alison here? Yes. Alison, hello. Yes. Hello. Alison, hello. welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for joining us all. So your members are receiving visitors again. How has the sector really survived during lockdown? Um, and, and what are the challenges? So they have to, to clean up between visitors. They have probably sometimes six hours to um, uh, make this happen. And between one guest leaving and the next guest coming and a lot of surfaces to clean. Um, we've been lucky here in the Southwest, but do you think people are a little bit nervous about bringing in people from other regions? So these are a number of questions um, that, that I'd like to ask to you and uh, hear your answers. Well, that, that's a lot of questions in one go, so I'll, I'll take them one at a time, if I may. Um, so how's lockdown been for the industry? It's been very hard. Um, you know, all our members are local residents and we all have the same concerns and worries about keeping ourselves and our families safe and healthy. Um, but the accommodation sector is one of those sectors where it that saw income drop to absolutely zero in a matter of days. So it's been really hard on a lot of our members. Um, we've had quite a few of us have had some government grants which have been very helpful. They've helped to cushion the fall a bit, but they aren't a long term solution. Um, we've had members who've had to take out significant loans to cover their costs during lockdown, not to mention refunding all the bookings that were cancelled during lockdown and for the rest of the year. Um, so it's been hard and I think it looks as if it's going to continue being hard, particularly in the city for quite some time yet. Um, on the plus side, people have spent the last few weeks preparing and getting ready to open safely and welcome guests back. So that's been a kind of a, a, a ray of sunshine despite the rain outside um, that, that we are now able to open. Um, as to how we're going to keep people safe, how we're managing, um, obviously everybody's main concern is to keep guests, our staff and themselves safe. That's really, we've, we've all got the same ambition there. Um, we've had a, a lot of guidance from government and from our professional associations and everybody is adapting their procedures to add enhanced cleaning, extra disinfectant and yeah, it is a lot of work, it's extra expense and it's a lot of extra work but if you're well prepared and you have a system it is, it can be done and it will be done. You know. um, Self-catering is, is, 
has a, a, a bit of an advantage over other areas in that by its very nature it's self-contained so we don't have the same issues of self, social distancing as uh, as other sect, uh, sectors do um, but uh, you know it's in no one's interest to skimp on safety and cleanliness you know hospitality generates for around 470 million for the bath economy around 1.3 billion and 28 thousand jobs in Somerset so we really need to give our guests the confidence and ourselves the confidence to get our businesses going again and the way we I think we do that is by operating as safely as as um, so uh, you know I think businesses are getting ready there are challenges but but we're dealing with them I think the main thing is is um, really that some people have got sort of used to it i mean it's three months and people have got used to uh, being quite isolated and by themselves and it's it, it's almost like just sort of getting people out of their little spaces again say come on um it's actually fun out here um uh, you can be safe um i mean i i personally felt quite strange almost like taking first steps again when when i went back to work um and you know, it's, it's that confidence building that is probably the most important thing, isn't it? I think that's absolutely right. And, and you know, we're all in the same boat there. I think you're right that people have spent a lot of time sitting at home feeling, feeling closeted. And yes, it, it is a change to go out and do the things that we used to do before, which is why, you know, why I think it's important that we demonstrate that we are changing the way we do things and that we're making the environment as safe for our guests as possibly can. And, and, and I think, you know, certainly our members are doing that. And the, the new certification schemes that have come out that put by Visit England and the AA, the uh, COVID confident and good to go, you know, these are certification schemes that we're all applying for, which hopefully will give people a bit of confidence that we are doing what we should be doing and and have you got an, an overview so generally of you know how how how, how full are your members yeah um it, it varies there seems to be uh, well there is quite a difference between the country properties and the city properties uh, and you know every time you pick up a newspaper these days you seem to see an article saying that uh, you know, British hospitality is is overbooked and the bookings are piling in. Well, it's not happening in Bath, I'm afraid. Um, I think if, you know, if you have a property in the country or on the coast, yes, people are busy. The country around the city is busy. The city is much less busy. And I think that's partly because, partly because people don't actually know what's open and what there is to do in the city. So, and that's where I think we need the support is to demonstrate that there are plenty of reasons for coming to Bath that you can do it safely but, but when you're here there are fun things to do you know just like there always have been you can go to the museums you can go to restaurants you can enjoy wandering around this beautiful city with its architecture but the, that's how we all we all need to work together I think to, to put the right face forward it, it, exactly. I think um, it's, it's slightly different for people who come to a city co compared to people who go to a country property. Those probably just want to enjoy nature and, and walk around uh, and, and, and enjoy the countryside. Whereas the people who are booking uh, in the city, they, they love the city life and they need to think that, woo, there's something to do and it's full and not empty and deserted. So, so it's, it's also about sort of getting pictures out there that Bath is filling up again. And for those who stayed in the city like I did, you know, it was absolutely extraordinary how empty it was, and 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 but to see gradually people coming back is uh, is is encouraging. But I think we need to get that out there into the light, wider world that yeah, it's the city life is coming back. Um, and as you say, we need to work together so people understand that they can go go and 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 eat out again. They can go to a museum again, as we will hear from Chris, and uh, they, you know they can have some fun. I think that's why why people will come into the city they want to have a bit of fun don't they yeah i, I agree absolutely absolutely is, is, there, is there anything you you think um you know me as the mp can do more or is you know let we are having a um, call here from the from the council is do you think there's anything that, that that sort of officials can do or elected members can do or uh, do you feel that we so far have done enough 
uh, well, you've certainly done plenty, and that's been appreciated, but there's always more that can, that can be done. I mean, I think, for me, I think the biggest, that's the two biggest things is that, you know, speaking as the accommodation sector, we can't market the city. We need uh, DMOs to do that, and we need them to have the backing to do that, because they can't do it on their own either. Um, and I, I think we, it, it would be good if the council were supporting us by opening up all the museums, not just one or two that are under their control. Um, I, I personally like to see the Fashion Museum opened up and the Victoria Art Gallery. I'd like to see support given to, to organisations like the Bath Preservation Trust so that number one Royal Crescent is encouraged to open because those are the sorts of things that bring people into the city. Um, and I think it's even more important now, given that we're not going to be able to have, you know, the, the festivals that we're used to seeing in the summer and the big events, certainly this summer. Um, I think it, 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 it just goes to show, Alison, first of all, I, I just wanted to ask you, can you just tell people what a DMO is? Because maybe... Sorry, I'm <laughs> sorry. Yes, of course. Destination Management Marketing Order. I, we should ask Catherine that one. <laughs> the organisation that, that markets our city. <laughs> yeah so uh, but but uh, and 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 but what you what you said i think is just so important you, you, you we can all feel how it is all interconnected isn't it so it's it's a big puzzle and the pieces in the puzzle need to all fit together in order to get um, the visitors back into the city well thank you so Absolutely. much for having for giving us an insight into your sector alison we come you. next to catherine uh, catherine is um, from visit bath um, she is our, she is representing our DMO um, and uh, thank you so much that, that you're, you're, you're here with us um, this afternoon. We are, a spa, we, 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 we are a spa city um, and in fact it's, it's, been, it, it's been interesting to actually look at Bath and, and the history of, of being a spa city and, 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 and the, 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 the reincarnation of the old spa city idea is, is all the wellness and the beauty industry and, and feeling you know, pampering yourself a little bit, um, and yet those industries um, are still not being able to open. Do you think that is actually one of our big problems? Uh, uh, today in the chamber, I actually asked the chancellor whether we can have an announcement of, of um, what the beauty industry, you know, what the beauty industry can expect. Um, and interestingly, yesterday there was another, uh, uh, you know, a strong group of women parliamentarians actually saying, is it that the beauty and well-being industry is often led by women, has got many women employees, and, and is this something where, where actually we as women need to come together and say, hey ho, this is such a strong, important sector, we need to make sure uh, 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 that, that, that we get, um, you know, new announcement from, from the government to make sure our beauty and wellness industry is, um, is coming on board again, because it's also such an important sector for our city. Um, first of all, I completely agree with you. Um, one of the things that we were horrified at when the, the, legis when the guidance from government came out after the announcement, um, of when businesses were going to open. Um, first of all, it didn't provide people time, but a, a lot of those spas and hotels have been making plans and were waiting on the guidance. When the guidance was announced that spas and um, indoor leisure, for example, can't open, um, that was a shock and, and it, you know, it, it presented a, a really difficult situation, um, I think, for Bath. Um, if you think that Bath is the number one destination for well-being in the UK when that unique selling point is taken away from you and you can't and you can't deliver on that it, it does make things difficult um, and I had a conversation with my counterpart at Shakespeare's England where we've got the number one spa destination without a spa operating and and she's got Shakespeare's England and you, they can't perform Shakespeare so you know we're we're, we're all sharing the pain together I think there are lots of opportunities for people to come and visit Bath. As we said, the Holborn opened on Sunday. Um, we have been, you know, our, our journey through this has been, from, from the Visit Bath perspective, ha has been fascinating after spending 20 years in the industry to, to look at what's um, the, the reaction and, and the response. So we, at, the, at the start, we spent a lot of time lobbying centrally through our organisation, Visit Britain, on lots of calls with the Department of Culture, Media, Sport, ensuring that we were telling them what the business community wanted. Um, we had to switch over everything into a virtual bath campaign so that 
the aim was to keep the destination alive in people's minds so there was lots of um, lots of things happening to uh, support businesses doing takeaway and food delivery and hosting virtual visits and then as we start uh, then start to move into opening up it's that gradual switch over and about six weeks ago when we were you know the, the 4th of July date was um, was booted we suddenly realized and I say we because I, I have two hats I'm, I'm also the head of tourism at Destination Bristol and suddenly we looked and went every single page on this website is out of date um, because you've got itineraries and, and visits and, and as Alison said everyone's procedures has ha have had to change and it's absolutely about consumer confidence and, and the city piece isn't unique to Bath irrespective of spas um, people are heading for the coast and the countryside in the first instance and one of the challenges that we have is um, Bath is phenomenally popular with international um, visitors but uh, even though there's half as many international visitors, visitors as there are domestic the spend is almost the same so you can see that economic reliance and I think pr predictions are that those international visits will not come back to the 2019 pace until at least 2024 so one of the things that we've been focusing on is, is maintaining relationships and retaining contact with those intermediaries to remind them of what Bath is. So um, there's been a lot of talk about Bath being a landscape city and Bath being a city surrounded by countryside, just trying to position ourselves um, as not just another city. And then making sure that, you know, as Alison said as well, as those attractions are opening up um, and will continue to open up, and the restaurant community this is about the pieces of the jigsaw coming together this is about having culture it's about having great places to eat and drink it's about being able to walk to cycle and and all of those assets that we have and and to encourage people to stay longer this isn't about people coming away for a night this is about them staying for a couple of days um, and i think one of the other challenges has been around particularly around access into the city a huge number of people visit bath by train um, and, and well, rail has been identified as um, for essential journeys only. I think that presents some short term challenges for us. It's, it's also an opportunity to do things differently, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, what do you think um, is, is, is one of the advantages? Because um, we don't want to be all doom and gloom. We want to be positive no. and look into, in, in, into a positive future. So is there anything where you think actually this is an opportunity where we can do some some things differently. Absolutely. And one of the things that we've been doing is lobbying um, and talking to journalists, both in the UK and overseas, and, and talking to our National Tourist Board. And we've been sharing information uh, with colleagues in the UK and overseas, and we've all been learning from each other. Um, and I think it's brought people close together. We've been on um, regular, you know, I've been speaking to businesses when I can, and we've been emailing and keeping in touch. And, you know, for the service accommodation sector, like Alison said about the self-catering, it's very individual. It, you know, we, we do see hotels in the city that are performing slightly better than they expected. And, you know, we've, we send a, um, we usually send a newsletter out every Friday just to keep in touch with people. At one point, I think we were sending things out every day. They were changing so regularly. Um, but certainly it's, as, as businesses start to reopen, like the Open Top Bus Tour this weekend, it's important that we keep reminding people as you say it's about everybody coming together and supporting each other um, and you know one of the ways we've supported that is, is we suspended we're a membership organization we suspended our membership payments um, during during the worst of this to try and help and encourage businesses um, at a time when they were at their lowest and you know one one of the other sector that's very closely linked to um uh, when people come and visit a city and i i'm always I'm a worst offender when i come into a city i go a bit of shopping so yeah. we've got wonderful we've got wonderful independent shops so you know what what has happened you know in 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 terms of the links with our independent shops particularly um, and that sector that has also been very very effective absolutely and you know one of the things that we've been doing as i said we're talking to journalists is presenting um, the opportunities to come to visit Bath and shop and see these unique shops and see these unique restaurants and places to grab a coffee that make it unlike anywhere else because without that distinctive independent feel then you end up being the same as everywhere else and we don't want to be the same as everywhere else 
Um, so um, just to reassure people, we, you know, we, we started the week with three, uh, three press inquiries um, from the UK and overseas that we're following up now. And this is absolutely about pushing the independent sector. Well, thank you um, for, for, for your part of the story. I'm sure you, you, there, there'll be questions to you later on. Um, oh, I just wanted to um, uh, re um, ask you about, there's a tool, a go-to tool that um, you have developed. Can you just quickly talk, talk us through that? The good-to-go tool? Can you be unmute, unmuted, please, Matt? Thank you. Sorry, uh, Matt, I had to wait for Matt to unmute me. Um, yes, it, it's a, there, there's a number of schemes that are operating and the, the one that we've been promoting is um, a scheme that's run um, across the UK called We're Good To Go. Um, it's an online scheme that businesses can go to free of charge. It takes 20 to 30 minutes to complete. It's essential that businesses have their risk assessment done because that's the starting process. We've been absolutely thrilled with the response in Bath. Um, I think Visit England were absolutely overwhelmed with the number of applicants. They had about 16,000 applicants in the first few days. Um, so we're relying on businesses to tell us and share their badge with us because we haven't got to the point yet where they've caught up to tell us. So um, th this provides what's been called a, a ring of confidence for consumers that people have gone through um, the process. Um, they can show customers that they, they take this responsibly. They know their responsibilities and that, that customers and, and staff can be reassured by that, um, that accreditation. Um, and is there, is there a link to go to or can you put that in the yeah, chat? Yeah, uh, what I'll do is I'll put that in the chat and it's important to, you know, this is for anybody involved in the, in the visitor experience. It's not unique to hotels or self-catering or, or museums. This is for, for shops, it's for restaurants. You know, use this while it's out there. It's free um, and it can provide that confidence and the more people that, that gain it, the more that we can push, um, we can push that Bath is a safer place to visit. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks for that. We, we move on to Chris. Chris Stevens, who's the director of the Hoban Museum. Good to see you. And uh, before we uh, started the, converse, uh, the, the, the evening, I, I actually said I, I was lucky to say the Grayson Perry um, exhibition just before um, uh, lockdown. And it was just, you know, for me, such a revelation. Um, and, and hopefully, um, you know, people will go and see it. I'll definitely see it again. Um, and it's so good to have a museum. Um, like 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 ours, the Hoburn um, in the city. So tell us what you think and you, how you can contribute to make sure that people flock into the city again. <laughs> well, I think you're right. That I mean, we're so lucky to have the Grace and Perry show. Um, well, firstly, you know, thank goodness we went into lockdown in March, having had the most successful six weeks we've ever had by a long way. So that gave us a little bit of protection from the hit because um, you know the Hoburn night most of the museums in Bath um, get no public funding, so we're completely reliant on ticket income. Um, and I think, um, you know, Grayson amongst artists is sort of almost unique for his kind of popular reach. And also he's a very kind of English, British sort of experience. So I think, um, you know, in a way, the attraction of that exhibition isn't affected by the lack of overseas visitors. Um, so I think, you know, one of the things we can do is use that exhibition and use the fact that, you know, he's just had this sort of massive hit during lockdown with his art club on Channel 4 with over a million viewers each week to um, bring a different kind of audience to Bath. If we can just get the message out there, we've sort of this week, we've been working at the National Press to try and get um, reports on the fact that the exhibition is open and it's extended till January, so you haven't missed it. Um, but I think also, um, as others have said, it's so important that, you know, within Bath, we all kind of work together to communicate the, the whole package of experiences from shops and bars and restaurants and all the museums that I think for a long time, there's often a tendency to, to think that because of the Roman bars, all the other little museums in Bath are sort of just kind of, you know, um, you know they're not part of the real core attraction. I think that's a mistake. And I think there's now greater recognition that it is actually the kind of collective experience of the whole city from 
us and Alison mentioned, you know, number one Royal Crescent, the American Museum with the gardens, as well as the baths, that we need to sort of make sure that within Bath and beyond, um, we're offering that sort of range of experiences from the sort of ancient heritage to, you know, quite rude pots from the 1980s. And, 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 and therefore it attract people to stay longer rather than just whizzing through. Um, and in fact, Bath is a city that, that grows and grows on you, isn't it? It's, it's something you need to take your time and, and experience all, um, and walking through on its own is, is wonderful, or doing some of these historic walks and then come across things. And um, I mean, the Herburn is almost a little bit outside the city, isn't it? In, yeah. in, in sense. <laughs> I, I didn't really believe it when I arrived three years ago and people told me that we were off the beaten track, but it's true that the sort of few hundred meters of Great Portney Street seems to be a long way. But I think there is a great, I mean, I think Catherine touched on this, that you know, Bath is an amazing city to spend time in and find the little hidden corners and um, sort of range across the city. But also, you know, people don't acknowledge that we're part of the Cotswolds. We have that link down to Somerset. Um, you know, there's a big sort of region around Bath, which we ought to be sort of um, recognised as being a part of. Well, and, 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 and also that we are not just um, an 18th century city. I mean, I like the fact, and that's why, um, you know, I, I was just so, you know, the exhibitions like the Grayson Perry exhibition, there's a very contemporary feel to Bath as well. And that's probably a side that we, we could market more. I, I'm just wondering, was it difficult to open the museums again? Did you have to plan a lot? Um, it was, yeah. I mean, lockdown sort of, I, th I feel that we we're in three phases. There was a sort of, you know, the weeks of rushing around to fundraise and furlough and protect the business and then a kind of lull when we probably should I should have been doing more forward planning and then weeks of sort of trying to get the museum ready to you know to be COVID compliant before the guidance was available <laughs> to respond to so you know um, so yeah the last few weeks have been mad really sort of creating one-way systems we reinstalled the exhibition so it's a completely different experience um, to how it was in February. So there's a one-way system through that. Um, and then also just the sort of anxiety of bringing staff back before your, before the income comes back um, from furlough and sort of, you know, and the, I mean, to be honest, at the moment, it's slightly scary that there are, you know, lots of staff working away and not that many visitors coming in. Um, I'm sure that we will, it will build up. But at the moment, in this miserable weather, it's, um, it's a little bit quiet. Yeah, I, I think if we all work together really and encourage and uh, I, I'll definitely go back and see it now that you tell, told me it's different, it looks different. <laughs> it's, a, it's a new exhibition, you see things in a different angle and from a different way. So no, so no excuse to say, oh, I've already seen this. No. So everybody on, the, on, on this call, you know, go and see it again. It's different. I was slightly but, upset on Saturday when we opened to our supporters that several people said it looked better now than it did before. Which... <laughs> All right. That's the exhibition's curator, I was upset <laughs> about. Yeah, well, thank you for, for, for that insight. We come to yeah. Peter Andrews now from the Green Park Brasserie. So how's, how's it been for you and for your business? How was the last weekend? Matt, can you unlock, un, unmute Andrew, please? Should be there. Good. You know, Super Saturday w w was fantastic. I mean, there'd always been you know, some stories about that it was going to be Armageddon on the streets and horrendous, drunken, awful behaviour. Um, from our own personal point of view, we, 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 you know, we're in hospitality because we love it. and we, we, we like looking after people and, and giving them a, a great experience. So to be back to doing that, one of the fundamental reason why we do it was amazing. Um, so the staff were really happy to be back. I think that for them, it was just like a step back to a, to a, a last some kind of normality and to have a bit more structure in their lives um, was fantastic. Um, and for the customers, they, they were all incredibly well behaved and you know, had a good time and we saw a lot of people. So it was busy and it was, it was, a, you know, it was a great day all round. So, so what are really the challenges um, about social distancing? And we heard a lot that drunk people weren't socially distanced. Did you have any of that? Um, no, not at all. I think that you know, people understand. I think that you know, the, it was great that the kind of the two meter thing had been dropped to the kind of the one meter plus type, um, which had made life a lot more sustainable. But you know, we obviously, we lost about uh, you know, nearly 40% of our restaurant capacity. And we're lucky with having the, the space outside with the pizza underneath the stationary roof and also 
the kind of bar tables out the, out the front. So um, we, we are very lucky in that regard. Um, so that, that there is quite a lot of space in the industry. It's very well ventilated. Um, but the, the actual kind of standard of behavior from everybody was, was, you know, was fantastic. I think that there was, um, you know, we, we didn't have any issues at all. But one of your attractions is always live performances. Is anything like that happening anytime soon? Well, we've got to be very careful with that. It's, um, it's one of those ones. I mean, it's, these, these, it's um, the government have published guidance, not regulation. Um, and on the page regarding live entertainment, um, it says, you know, it's, it's not something that you should be doing. But then here are the five steps that you need to do to do it. Um, so you're not allowed to sing. Um, there shouldn't be any wind, wind instruments, just obviously trying to keep the aerosol effect down. Um, so we actually you know, did go slightly out on a limb. And um, uh, so we, we basically brought in a very muted trio who um, uh, you know, played in the corner. You know, so we'll socially distance, no wind instruments, no singing. Um, and so we, we'd, we'd done a risk assessment and we were pretty happy with it. And our environmental health consultants were, were happy about it. Um, so you know, for the first day back, we, we, we did actually do it. Fabulous. I, I mean, you know, what everybody tells me here, the, the, the opportunities that are out there for the people who sort of can think outside the box and, 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 and are creative and, and, uh, and, and also take a few risks. I mean, I think that's what I, what I hear a lot, that you, you have to, government guidance is all well and good. Um, but sometimes you have to make your own assessment of what you really think is safe. And I mean, I'm somebody super, super cautious about the whole thing. I really don't want to get this bug or the virus. It really sounds nasty. And it's always like you think it's somebody else is getting it and, and you're very surprised if you're getting it yourself. So I, I really, really don't want to catch anything. I'm, I'm, I'm one of the cautious people. I, but you know, I can also see that if I don't come out of my little, or out of my little sort of snail house, um, you know, I won't live again. So I have to rely on you guys to say, "Come on, this is safe. Yeah. I've made that assessment. Uh, uh, we had the risk assessment, and there's new things to enjoy that maybe we we didn't know before lockdown." I mean, they, they, we have to say that the safety of our staff and the customers you know, is the number one thing. But yeah, so we so we have been really rigorous with the risk assessment to make sure that, that you know, as I say, we're, we're lucky. We've got a big airy restaurant, and we've got a you know, massive amount of ventilation of you know, the wind blowing through. So um, you know, I was personally very happy that, that, we, 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 that, that we we were doing all we should, and we were we were you know, I was happy to proceed on that basis. And 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 everybody recognizes that it's in nobody's interest to have an, another peak anyway. So you know we. Uh, we we are cautious. We were lucky in Bath, weren't we? We didn't actually have that many cases. Uh, you know, is there a nervousness about bringing people people in from other areas? Or um, I, I, I don't think so, personally. I, I'm that I, I think that uh, I've spent a lot of time over these you know, few months obsessing about the figures and, and looking at the kind of uh, some of the statistical data. And I think some of the language we've had from the media hasn't been helpful. And, and when we talk about surges and spikes and explosive growth, it all gets you know, very, uh, very bad. And we, we obviously do need to be careful. But I think that, that that's the, the fundamental thing of, as human beings. We, um, we, we actually ought to be, be trusted a bit more and actually be able to assess what the risk is around us to a certain extent. I mean, the government has issued good guidelines and you know, we're, we're staying well within that. Um, but on the other hand, it's that you know we do need to start living. That for a lot of people, that that, that they've lost a lot of their uh, a lot of their living experience, and and you know, we we do need to start that up again. What about the council? The council has spent forty million pounds to help businesses. Has that been helpful? Or oh yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, I mean the the, the uh, we, we had the benefit of the kind of the uh, a grant with the rates, um, so that, that that was very helpful. Um, and and as, you know, it puts us in a, in a more solid position. I mean, we're, we're lucky we've been here a long time and we're, we're a very solid business. Um, so, uh, it, but, but the, all that kind of thing helps um, and means we, you know, we, we, we've got, uh, uh, we can look at the, the, the various scenarios and say, all right, okay, if we're trading at that level, that's what we need to do. If we're trading at that level, then we have to do that. Um, so I'm, I'm very confident about the long term. It's, it's obviously the question of how quickly the, uh, initially the domestic market gets going and people coming in from the regions back into Bath 
um, and in the longer term, the international is coming back. So that's again a lot about the the, the perception of uh, the, 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 the the well the general public's perception of risk um, and, and how how at risk that, that they are. So that, that that's going to be an interesting story over the over the next few you know, months, really. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, now that uh, we've heard that um, the council was was helpful. Um, we go seamlessly to Paul Crossley, who is a cabinet member for um, Community Services. Um, and can you just tell us a little bit more, Paul, while you are unmuting yourself? Um, I'm asking some questions. What has the council done to help reopen the city? Um, you know, what can we expect? Uh, you know, the Roman bath and uh, all those things that we, we are used to that um, the council is ultimately the control over. Uh, well, thank you, um, Vera. Yes. Bath is ready, but it's going to be uh, slower than the worst before, and there'll be smaller numbers. And so we have a, a different type of tourism that we're going to be managing uh, as we uh, recover from this pandemic. The Roman Bars uh, reopened on uh, Monday, and uh, we spent a lot of time, again, as with the Holborn, making a one-way system round. So the whole experience it actually uh, is different from from before when you're going around with big crowds and I was there on the opening day and we welcomed uh, an American family uh, stationed at one of the US Air Force bases in Cambridgeshire and they had a really uh, good day out so there, there is the possibility to pick up uh, foreign tourists even if they've not flown here um, so that went well. Uh, one of your earlier speakers said that uh, why wasn't the council opening up the BAG and the, and the Fashion Museum? Uh, we will be opening those up, but that won't be coming till uh, Easter next year. Uh, we've got, as part of our safe uh, reopening, uh, and it was interesting to see one of the other speakers say that the uh, safety of the customers and staff was paramount. Uh, and that is certainly the true for us. So what we've got in the Roman Bars experience is we've got far more staff available to help and guide people around for far less visitors so uh, that it's more expensive to run the operation but we were delighted to get people back in and, and as one of your other speakers said uh, the staff were really happy uh, to be back at work. So what are we doing elsewhere? Uh, well the government uh, has given us uh, a first tranche grant for the hospitality and small uh, business sector and we've given out uh, 3, 000, uh, over 3,000 grants, which is about 40 million. And of those, uh, about 930 have gone to people in uh, the hospitality leisure uh, sector that, for this webinar. Uh, and that's totaling about 19 million of that 40 million. So we've also got discretionary grants. Again, this is a fund that's given to uh, us by government. And we've put out uh, nearly three quarters of a million on that and a second round of discretionary grants is now available. Uh, you register for discretionary fund. If you look at that on the council website, uh, you can find out more about that. We've also looked at rent deferrals uh, and different types of rent deferrals uh, for uh, many of our hard pressed uh, businesses that uh, rent from the council. And we're looking for skills support and, and training for redundancy. There's undoubtedly uh, going to be uh, people that need retraining and reskilling from from this uh, uh, COVID catastrophe, and so we're last starting to look at how we can help with the reskilling and, and retraining. But I think we also have to look at uh, the future and be optimistic. Uh, if the first wave of people getting out is to the countryside and to the, the, the beaches, then undoubtedly they will soon want to be coming for culture and other types of tourism so they will be coming back to Bath we think in, in numbers and to this uh, we're looking at reopening the town and city centres not just city of Bath so there's going to be a lot more uh, pedestrian areas uh, and uh, we're looking at a range uh, with, as with anything like this there's a lot of learning as we go along um, some of the pubs in Queen Street would like a bit more uh, tables and chairs down there and we're learning about this uh, uh, approach to tables and chairs that countries like Vilnius have but we have to operate within uh, licensing rules and regulations. Um, the government has speeded that up uh, which is to be welcomed. Uh, what used to be uh, in excess of a 20-day process is now a five-day process and unless there's a good reason to say no the answer is yes. Uh, so you know it's good that um, the central government is looking at the bureaucracy 
and making that more flexible because one of the other things is clear we need to be able to move swiftly and nimbly on some of these things so when we get an application for tables and chairs we need to be able to get that resolved very quickly and as i said the deadline for that is five days and unless there's a good reason for saying no the answer will be uh, yes one of the other things that i think that we do uh, as a council have to work with and notice is that uh, there's going to be a lot of mental health problems uh, from this uh, COVID emergency, even if they uh, are not immediately manifest. You know, th this uh, lockdown has traumatized uh, many people, many families and many business, small businesses. And so we're, we're starting to put work in with our, our um, CCG and our health providers about preparing for what we think could be a, a follow on uh, growth in mental health issues. Uh, and again, so there's a variety of things that the council has been doing, and I hope that uh, answers your questions. Well, thank you, Paul. Um, I think um, the interesting thing is, is again, you know, will our city actually look a little bit different? We've got very narrow streets. We still have got quite a lot of traffic going through the city centre. And is this actually um, a new start for something that might, you know, where our city looks and feels differently? And you know, let, 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 let me tell you, I mean, I get all sorts of people coming my way. So I had somebody who uh, normally um, provides marquees for weddings um, and his business is now uh, finished for the, for, for the summer. Most weddings had to be canceled. And he said, well, you know, I've got this idea to so have, have a great big covered area, area, for example, in Kingsmead Square, where, you know, you've got lots of businesses and people who, who can't um, have the indoor spaces, but still wants to provide a cover and a roof, um, you know, could, could something be done like this? And I said, well, yeah, I think it's an interesting idea. I think um, it would be good to see that the council is, is open for, you know, slightly in, interesting, different ideas um, where, where we say, well, yeah, we haven't done this before, but why not look into that? Is, do you think that's possible? I'm, I'm not saying this particular thing, but, but something new and different that we haven't seen. Uh, well, yeah, no, I'm, I'm up for listening to a covered market idea. Uh, the, the, the markets that we have uh, are uh, starting up again in, in, at the end of this month and, and into August. So you will see some of our markets coming back uh, across the town in, in various locations. But the idea of a covered market, uh, I'm not quite sure how big his tent is, but the, I would just remind you there's a very big tree in Kingsmead Square. <laughs> yeah, no, he had, I, I think it was not for a market, but where you could put table and chairs to, to cater for all yeah. you know, the, the, the cafes and, and, and the little catering places around Kingsmead Square so people can buy um, and basically like a takeaway, but rather than taking it home, uh, right. there, t there are tables out there and at least um, while it's warm, it, it, it's still possible. And also you can leave the sides open so it's much more, much more aired. I thought it was an interesting idea. I, I said, well, I'll try. Um, and I think I've pushed him somewhere in, in the direction of the council. I don't know how far that's gone, but I like these ideas. I like the idea mm -hmm. that, that people are coming from different parts who had a, a different business model, but now start to rethink. And I think, uh, uh, yeah, it's at least interesting to see these things and not, not immediately say, ah, no, we can't do this, that, and the other. So I think it's, it's up to all of us to, to uh, be open to uh, creative new ideas. Well, thank you, Paul. I, we do have Barry Gilbertson um, uh, hit with us um, t uh, this, uh, tonight as well. Um, we are still a World Heritage Site, Barry, aren't we? Uh, or um, do you think our World Heritage status is our, our unique USP, and is it actually that we are a wellness city or a party city? Uh, and what can we do with um, our unique World, World Heritage, Heritage Site status? Well, thank you, Vera. Let me just um, give a little bit of background because not everybody is, is we're, uh, totally aware of the fact that we are a World Heritage City. And in the UK, um, of the 1,121 World Heritage Sites around the world, the UK has the eighth largest number of them. And it is proven around the world that tour companies steer their itineraries by World Heritage Sites. So how important is Bath in that context? Well, the, in the UK, we joined the uh, UNESCO Convention in 1984, and Bath was the sixth World Heritage Site to be granted that inscription in 1987, 
in the same year as Westminster Abbey. Importantly, it was uh, the year before the Tower of London in 1988. And that gives you some idea of the way in which people believe Bath is really important uh, as a World Heritage Site. And as you mentioned the word unique, um, we are, you can't be relatively unique, obviously, but um, in terms of world heritage, there are only two cities in Europe w that have the whole city as a world heritage site, and that is Venice and Bath. So all of those things are really important to us as a city, but also we're very close to getting our second world heritage inscription as a member of the Great Spas of Europe uh, application, which without the uh, virus would have been heard at the World Heritage Convention this year in um, China. Um, and that fits fantastically well with our wellness and well-being location. Um, Great Spas of Europe is a project of 11 uh, spa towns and cities across Europe who will be uh, with their inscription as a World Heritage Site, marketing themselves jointly. Now, of course, we've heard from Catherine this evening that the international market is not going to return immediately, and it certainly might take uh, a while, maybe up to 2024, to get back to 2019 levels. But I would argue that um, that also is an opportunity for us because we can say to many people in um, close by Europe, but also particularly here in the UK, that this is a fantastic opportunity for you to come to Bath and see our city, actually at the moment with less visitors than we normally get, because a lot of the international visitors won't be coming. Now to give you an, uh, a quick um, number on that, a comparison with um, Amsterdam, for example, that for every resident of Amsterdam, they receive 17 visitors uh, or tourists. And in Bath, for every resident of the city of Bath, 98 tourists come to our city in 2008 in 18. And so there will be less tourists. We have to accept there will be less tourists, but let's think about turning the marketing on its head and saying this is a great time to come to our city. Not only that, but Bath has in World Heritage terms, six attributes of outstanding universal value. Now, every World Heritage site around the world has to have at least one, and there are very, very few that have six attributes of outstanding universal value. Ours include the Roman archeology, span the three hot springs, Georgian town planning, all that beautiful Georgian architecture, uh, 18th century social ambition and the, the fantastic countryside setting of the city. And you know, uh, coming to Bath at the moment, you have a fantastic opportunity to wander around and look at the town planning and the architecture from the Georgian era in the center of the city. You know, to, to look at the outside of the Mineral Water Hospital, for example, right in the center of the city, lovely inscription uh, on the stonework on the side of the building, 1737. What a fantastic thing. You know, working with um, the Roman baths, there's an opportunity, of course, to see some of the Roman architecture. And thinking about the green setting of the city, you know, the Bathscape project are working enormously hard to get people out into the countryside. So if you can get more uh, UK people, to come and stay with us here in the city. You know, a, a staying visitor on average in 2018 uh, was spent 225 pounds a head in comparison to a day visitor who on average spent 38 pounds a head. Yeah, so so really we, we really would be yeah, thank, fantastic. Uh, thank, thank you, Barry. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Right? Run over because everybody has been, been absolutely fascinating from their, from their field and you have made a wonderful pitch for you know the world um, heritage site is alive and kicking and i uh, uh, i know for example in venice you know venice is empty and the people who've been to venice it, it's just a completely new different experience and i think you're absolutely right we should make the most of that actually currently um 
there are a few a few fewer people and it gives you a new and different experience so that in itself it might be a, a, a marketing opportunity we've run a little bit of I, I do apologize to our audience for that it, uh, but we can possibly also run over the event a little bit if nobody minds I just wanted to ask a last question to everybody are we open to business are we open again bar just very quickly thumbs up oh, yes of course we are <laughs> we are excellent well it's it's over to um, you the audience now Matt is going to lead that session and Matt, I, I, I um, assume you've got plenty of questions already in the chat. Yeah, lo lots of questions, lots of ideas. Um, people talking about doing things outside. I mean, uh, we haven't got anyone from the music or, or theatre here, but I don't know whether, Chris, you know, in your experience, how easy is it to do stuff outside? I don't know, with, with an exhibition or sculpture exhibition or something, and, and how, how important is the council to help uh, deliver outside events? They didn't need to unmute. <laughs> oh, okay. There we go. Sorry. Um, well, it's, I mean, in theory, it should be easy, but I mean, the, as someone said, I think, in the chat, weather is an issue. I mean, I'm looking out of the window, it's pouring with rain. Um, um, and it's and it's not always um, that cheap to do that. I mean, certainly if you're bringing in a sculpture and stuff, but, you know, having said that, um, you know, there's a great creative community in Bath and, you know, certainly from our point of view, I've already said to some, if anyone has an idea for, you know, whether it's a theatrical performance or music or something else, and they're looking for an outdoor space, then we'd love to, um, you know, welcome them. So do get in touch. Because I think the more we can use, you know, the gardens like the Holborns and Sydney Gardens and the other parks, um, the better. Paul, is there licensing issues around outside activities? How, how helpful uh, can we be? Uh, well, as I said uh, earlier, the uh, the uh, thing on tables and chairs is now decided within five days with the default answer being uh, yes, unless you've got a good reason to say no. So the, the tables and chairs will be coming out uh, uh, a lot quicker uh, than under normal licensing. So licensing has changed to uh, enable that to happen. So I think that that's good. I think uh, one of the interesting things, and this is perhaps... Uh, for Catherine to take up because it was also in 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 uh, the questions there is the uh, Christmas market this year and whether we get that going and I think we we're approaching the next three or four weeks will be when we have to to make that decision about uh, uh, the Christmas market because there's you know stalls to be uh, ordered produce to be made uh, and all all those people but uh, we'll have to see I think in the next three or four weeks see how the, the numbers in the COVID infections go and what the guidance from the government is. But that, that could be a really good end to the year if we can get that in place, even if it's on a different scale, perhaps a bit smaller, a bit more spread out this year. Okay, there's lots of ideas about marketing the city as a small city that you can walk around. Uh, how, how, else, uh, how else can we market the city uh, and how, how do we go about um, marketing the city to the rest of the UK? Catherine. Thank you. Um, well, what, I, it's been really interesting looking at the comments and people's ideas. Um, so here, here's a way of collaboration. Um, one of the things that's really important is um, that terrible marketing speak of content generation. Um, one of the things we've been developing is whether it's through social media channels, or whether it's on blog posts. If anybody wants to put together an itinerary of their ideas of the best way to spend time in Bath, share it with us. We'd love to see it. Um, we've recently, to, to, to celebrate the reopening of the Holborn and the Roman Baths, they took over our Instagram for a day. Um, nobody really wants to see what Visit Bath has to say all day, every day. It's nice to mix it up with different people's ideas of what they should do. And that extends out again, seeing some of the, the chat in the comments. It, it doesn't have to be immediately in city centre Bath. We're in a beautiful location. We've got the whole of North East Somerset. Let's use it. Um, and put together, you know, your, you know what, what are your favourite places to walk? Where are your favourite places to cycle? What are the things that you love, that you'd love to share with visitors? If you don't have anyone to invite into the city yourself and you're, ha and you're happy to share people, to share these ideas with people, we'd love to hear from you. 
Um, so, uh, other comments, uh, there's a comment from Charles to say, agree there was a great atmosphere at the Green Park Brasserie on sat Saturday night. Uh, well done, Charles. A um, uh, point there, yes, from Alan, the grant uh, was centrally funded and administered by the local authority. Uh, support for tables and chairs being out. Um, really lots of support for the, for the Christmas market. Um, yeah, get, get the message out. Bath So Maps map app. Ah, oh, there's a thing from, point from here from Joe, Bath So Maps and app. Uh, all the itinerary ideas can be put on the app and I'd very much like to work with you. So um, uh, that's, that's good. Are there any other apps uh, and social media um, things that are going on um, for the city, for tourists in the city? I don't know if Catherine or Paul can. Well, I could just chuck in um, the, Catherine mentioned Instagram, but you know, one mustn't forget other sources of social media like Facebook and like Twitter. You know, for example, the, the, our, world, our own World Heritage site and World Heritage UK as an organization and Bath Preservation Trust with each of its four museums are all tweeting on a daily basis with different uh, content uh, to try and attract people to the city. Uh, so we hope that that's been useful. Um, trying to get number one um, a Royal Crescent open again would be fantastic for the city. A lot of, you know, 60,000 people a year go through that, that museum um, in the city. And that's a lot of people. Yeah, I think it's great, you know, everyone sharing content, everyone share, sharing their stories, both their own and then sharing other people. So we reach multi audiences. Um, the majority of the Visit Bath um, uh, social audience, so not just the Instagram, um, but certainly around Twitter and Facebook and, and um, our phenomenal consumer newsletter, which frightens me how many people it goes to, um, plus the, the website. There's a huge range of places to share and, you know, it's just getting sensible about tagging people in and buddying up. There's been some great work in the cultural sector before with buddying up, making sure people are sharing content. And, you know, this is about supporting each other because it is going to be a, a challenging route back. But I think we're really well placed to do that. And um, today, uh, the Chancellor uh, made some announcements about VAT for the sector. Um, uh, I don't know, Alison or Andrew, VAT. Uh, reductions how how is that going to uh, how is that going to help I think for me it's, it's going to help a lot I mean I think that we're, we're all <clears throat> quite surprised I mean having been around for a long time the the last VAT cut was a three percent temporary cut after you know I think um, Alistair Darling did so to have whilst well, it's only on food and not on the alcohol side of things to have a 15 percent cut um, I think was was bigger than anybody was predicting and um, uh, you know, will will make a substantial difference to to a lot of people. Um, so you know, I'll, I'll, you know, hats off to, to Rishi Sunak. Really, I think that he, he he's gone large with it, um, and um, I think it, you know that, that they're certainly trying to get that V-shaped recovery. So um, which would be a good thing. And I think also in terms of the other thing of trying to keep people employed, I think they've obviously had a look at that of the of the not only the the financial costs but the mental health costs of unemployment. Um, so um, I'm pretty encouraged by what they've done with that. So like all these things, still got to look at some of the detail when it actually comes out. But certainly in terms of the kind of the headline things that they were pushing out, um, that was pretty better than I expected. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I would support that, as, uh, would echo that as well. I mean, for years, the accommodation sector has been asking for a reduction in the VAT level because the UK VAT level on accommodation is significantly higher than most of the rest of Europe and has been for a long time. So any reduction is, is obviously very welcome, although it won't help necessarily help all our members, most of which are micro businesses and may actually not be up to the VAT threshold and almost certainly won't be this year in particular. But it, it's always good news. There's a reduction. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so because I have a small holiday let and uh, we were half full but we just had a couple more bookings uh, this week so you know we, we're we're getting towards fully booked 
uh, and I think our first visitors were actually visiting family in Bath, so they, they're not even here to, to do the tourist thing, they're, they're here to, to be based and then visit family. Um, uh, Rich, Richie's um, asking the question about the Visitor Information Centre, uh, is that a social distancing issue? Catherine. One of the chat, yeah. Sorry, I was just waiting to unmute. One of the challenges we've got with the visitor information centre is exactly that about social distancing. Um, we, we've been in a measured, and it's just incredibly difficult uh, to open in, in a sustainable way at the moment. Um, we're continuing to review our options, and as soon as there's something to say, then obviously we'll make a statement. Uh, and Alison, I'm I'm assuming that uh, anyone who uh, stays. Um, with, with any of us who, who are hosts, um, we've got lots of knowledge, whether it's B&B, self-catering or hotels, we've got all that knowledge that we can share with visitors. Absolutely. Um, yes, we have. And in fact, we have our, our own digital apps as well, which have city guides and, and we have the Bath Reward Card, which promotes all independent businesses. So yeah, we're, we're all doing our bit. Um, and I'd sort of like to echo Catherine's request for content. You know, the Bath Self Catering Association and the Independent Guest House Association are always delighted if anybody would like to send us information about events or, or special events that are being run, and we can help promote them too. But you have to tell us, <laughs> please. Um, there's a good question from Susan. Um, is this an opportunity to reassess our target visitor profile? We know who, who comes now, or maybe came before lockdown, but what is the best profile for the city? I'm, I'm assuming that's a question for you, Catherine, because I've got no idea what the answer there. there, there there's two things at play here. There, there's one about who you target and then there's those that come anyway. Um, in, in terms of targets, we want people um, to come and, and stay longer and spend more money, which is really brutal. Um, and it's the same for every other destination. And we want people to come and explore and explore the independent businesses and the countryside. Bath makes a great base to explore the rest of the region as well. Um, and then you have the bonus of if, if you are staying in the city, for example, you have the bonus of having all these great places to eat and drink on your doorstep. Um, so, so there is an opportunity there. Um, there are people that will come to Bath because they love it and they always will. Um, and, and that's important that, that we welcome them as well. In, in terms of targets, um, there will be a slow soft move around from the international markets. As I said, we've kept in contact with those people in the middle, if you like, who, who can help to facilitate that travel because people don't just find out about where to stay or, or places to go by accident. So there's been some deliberate work taking place with um, deliberate work taking place with with particular um, magazines and, and uh, bloggers, so that they can feature Bath in in places that we think might get to the right people. Um, it's been work taking place for a while with people at the other end of Air Routes um, out of Bristol Airport, and and also you know. Before all this happened, there was a huge amount of work taking place um, with GWR about matching up some, some interesting places and, and, and using some interesting ideas along the rail route, which we hope to pick back up at a, a, a different stage. Um, someone's just picked up, I've just seen a comment flash up, which is why I kind of stumbled over my words about um, weddings. Um, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, you, you'd be hard pushed to find a more romantic um, place to get married. Um, and that, that is some content that's been worked on. The other thing is um, uh, business events and conferences. Um, I, keep, I, I, I was told uh, just before I started um, in the autumn last year Bath, by some people that Bath isn't really a conference destination. Well, you know, it is, it can be, and, and also the incentive travel as well. These, these are huge opportunities. And um, we, we've done a couple of um, virtual events which are very bizarre where you end up in a virtual booth and would take you into Zoom meetings and one-to-one. -one. And we've actually um, had some direct leads as a result of both a European and a US one that are looking for um, business events and conferences and incentive events um, through up to 23 and 24. So you just, be, just because um, 
the doors haven't been open or the business doors haven't been open we've been ensuring that we've done all that prep work behind the scenes couple, a couple more questions then um uh, one for you paul uh, a question from jonathan or a point from jonathan park and ride use is going to be minimal uh, especially as uh, as we're discouraged from using um public transport uh, are we are we about to break out the uh, electric scooters for people to get around Bath? Um, well, first of all, yes, uh, our, our park and ride income is is definitely down quite substantially. It's it's one of the three big hits that the council has taken, uh, and uh, park and ride income is down. Uh, we are, as you quite rightly point out, also just starting a pilot uh, for the government on these new electric scooters. And there, that's not just in Bath, that is um, Bath, uh, North East Somerset, uh, Bristol and South Gloucestershire, I think. Uh, so it's going to be quite a big pilot uh, for them uh, and they're going to be available for renting and getting around. But there's going to be many, many questions that have to be resolved uh, and answered about the way people use them because they can actually get uh, quite fast. Uh, and they're meant to be on the road, not the pavement. So it's, there's going to be a lot of questions. So I, I'm glad that the government is piloting them uh, I think uh, and I'm pleased that we're one of the areas taken chosen for piloting because I think they will ease a lot of the space problems that we have in Bath because of our narrow roads um, but going back uh, um, on that I think the park and rides you're quite right there is a problem because at the moment you know the buses are severely restricted in the numbers they can have on them so therefore, uh, what that should mean is that uh, the, the parks, the car parks in the centre of Bath will be operating at, at a higher percentage of the parking than normal, because actually as there's, there's going to be uh, less cars overall coming in as we build up our trade. But I think it's all, it's, I think one of the messages we must put is positive. You know, this is still a good place to come. There, you know, there are, there are lovely restaurants, there are good, interesting bars, you know, as well as the... Um, uh, as the Roman Bath Museum and our many small independent museums. So there's a, a lot to come here. So that you've got all the walking that can be done uh, from here. There's, so you've got the wonderful canal uh, path that you can go out and walk along. Uh, and that might be uh, very popular for these e-scooters, uh, put some more pressure onto that very crowded path as well. So th there's a, a lot of opportunities uh, as well as the problems to address uh, with the opportunities that come. Okay, and uh, one last question. Well, I'll, so there's a comment from Frank to say, uh, well done for the road closures, uh, like Kingsmead Square, Seven Dials next, please. Um, and again, making the city centre a really nice place to walk around. Um, but a question from Giles. Uh, whilst the government has announced various support schemes, do the panel think more substantial sector support on a bigger scale is required to get through three winters uh, three winter months to easter and well into 2021 if so what andrew i was i was gonna <laughs> i was gonna start with you <laughs> um because you you've got a food side to your business and a drinks side to the business at, at green park um do you do you do you need further support or what 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 do you need as a business it's an interesting one isn't it i think that, you know, i think the yeah, we, we all look at our businesses and, and we and we went into business because we saw it as a vehicle to, to you know, have a better life, you know, to enjoy ourselves more and, and, to, and to make a better living. Um, and in my case, I kept on being sacked, so there was only one, one reason to kind of, um, to carry on. Um, but in terms of government support, that, 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 that I, I would say that most people are quite surprised at the level that they've already given. Um, it's, it's you know, different businesses are, are in different places, so it depends on you know, on your level of debt, um, your normal margins. So it, it's you know, so if you're in a small restaurant or a small bar and you can't get many people in, then then it's going to be really difficult to kind of to, to 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 switch or to be able to keep going. Um, and I think that the, the main thing with the, the, the government, well, we all have to do um, is to actually build confidence. Um, we've only just started having kind of people coming out again and i think that once people get used to going out more and realize that actually you know the, the you know the, the risks are being well managed um, and then it's a safe place to come to um, then i think that trade will will come up the interesting bit of course is that inevitably that you know, that there will be some rises of, of coronavirus again 
And I think it's again getting across the message that this is a very different disease to how it was in March and April and our treatments are much better and um, we're in a much better place to actually to, to, to deal with, with, with um, you know, should there be a, be, a, be a rise in numbers. So I think it's just actually you know, the main job of government is, is actually to try and um, uh, explain the situation a bit better and uh, to promote more confidence in the, in, for, for people to go out and, and, and return to a, to a more normal life again. Thank you. Uh, there's lots more comments coming in, but it's gone ten past now, so I'll, I'm I'm going to hand back to to Vera. Well, it's been absolutely fascinating, and I'm sure we should really have a follow-up. I I feel it's coming. So do this again in three months' time and see wh where we are. Um, and um, uh, if everybody's on for that, I, I'd say that be well, that be quite interesting to monitor the progress and where we are going and. Obviously, um, we'll also see where, where the COVID pandemic itself goes and, you know, whether actually we, we are starting to open up again for international um, tourists. Uh, you know, these sort of things are all in flux. And I think it's very, very important to keep a very close track on what's happening in order to make sure that, that we as Bath, um, we have a, a, a great summer 2021. Uh, we, we will have a good summer 2020 but i think you know we really need to take the long long view and make sure um, that we get quickly back on, on our feet but also to take a long view and see whether we can start making those differences which will make um the visit bath experience even better uh, than before COVID. that's at least my ambition and who knows thank you very much for for your attendance everybody um it's been um, a real pleasure to hear from all of you I hope for our audience, it's been a good evening as well. Um, and uh, see you soon again and have a, have a good summer. Hopefully the good weather is coming back. I think that's one of our main things, isn't it? You know, somebody with a, a, a little bit of an ear to um, whoever makes the weather, because that would make such a difference to all of us. Thank you and good night.